Hi, this is Michael Campbell, the founder of Glossica. As uh, many of you who learn languages or you may be budding polyglots may know, there is a scary thing that people pass the word around out there in languages, and it's this word called ergative. Ergative sounds like a scary word, but I'm going to teach you in this video how ergativity works and how you can understand ergativity right now with your own language, with any European language you're learning, or a real ergative language. The first thing we want to understand about any language, uh, about language structure is, the best way to understand language structure is, is with role and reference grammar. And with role and reference grammar, basically we ignore the subject-object paradigm or framework that is used in languages. Why? Because subject and object paradigm that really kind of um, take languages and it, it really messes up like describing real-world events and putting it into a subject-object framework. Um, with role and reference grammar, the great thing about it is that you have agents and you have themes and you have uh, causative agents and you have beneficiaries. And this describes the role of each thing in the sentence really, really clearly. It also defines what kind of a verb is there, whether it's a static verb or a causative verb or an existential verb. And so role and reference grammar is a really, really great, great way not to just to understand the semantics of a sentence, but also the structure of the sentence. And the great thing about that is that it, I feel it's better than X-bar theory because you don't have any of those trees to, to graph out. In fact, I can mess up the order of anything in my sentence and I still have the exact same meaning and I still have the exact same, yeah, exact same meaning and structure in the sentence. So it's sort of, uh, what we use here at Glossica is something that is an order-free kind of grammar. It means I can uh, you know, turn anything into any other order and I still have the same meaning. So the problem with the subject object framework is that it's used mostly in European languages. But when you understand the ergativity that I explained in this video, you're gonna find that this is gonna help you understand how reflexive verbs work in languages like Spanish, French, German, and uh, Russian, and across all the other European languages. So the thing is, is that um, real ergative languages, ergativity can appear in languages like the Austronesian languages, maybe like Tagalog, but you also get it appearing in, in Basque. And in a special case with Georgian, it only happens in a very specific um, case in Georgian. But when we take a look at the role and reference uh, grammar approach to language, we can understand exactly how it's used in both Basque and Georgian. And we can also apply this to Korean and Japanese, because as you know, there are certain markers that go on the end of words in Korean and Japanese, like the wa, or the ga, or the e, or the nun. And so understanding this whole ergativity concept can really help you decide what is the right ending to use in Japanese and Korean. So let's take a look at a few examples. And the first one is we're going to talk about um, cooking dinner. And the second example is uh, closing something shut. So with the first example, if I say I'm cooking dinner, well, the thing is, is that in English we can admit the person who's doing it. I can admit the word I'm, I'm doing it. I can just say dinner is cooking. Now the thing that, uh, the thing that we need to notice about the dinner here is that the dinner really is a theme. And the dinner has an adjective associated with it. The, and that's what we call the state. So the dinner is either raw or uncooked, or the dinner is cooked and it's ready to go. Like they say in Slavic language, datov, it's ready. Or it can also have the, the meaning of uh, it's uh, cooked. So when I say dinner is cooking, the dinner isn't doing anything itself. You know, I guess you could use a reflexive verb in, in European languages, but it, you know, the dinner is cooking um, the dinner doesn't actually have a body and is actually doing something to something else, like cooking. No, the dinner itself is cooking all by itself. And so the dinner is sort of this absolutive thing. So I can say cooking, cooking is the dinner or the dinner is cooking. It doesn't matter if I put it before or after the verb. It's, it's just the theme of the sentence. It's just absolutive. So um, it's not really receiving any action. You know, the dinner is, under, is changing its state. Okay, so in the, in the second example, if I say, I closed the door shut, uh, what I'm doing is I'm changing the state of the door. The door was open, and now the door is closed. So I change the state of the door from closed, I'm sorry, from open to shut. The door's adjective was opened, and now the door's adjective is closed or, or shut. So shut is the final state that, um, it's the resultative state of of that action. So 
over the course of decades of um, frequency use, English tends to take that resultative action and then turn it into its own verb all by itself. So instead of saying, I closed the door shut, we can now take the shut and make a new verb and say, I shut the door. And a lot of um, words are showing up in English like this. For example, I gave him a gift, and now I've heard the gift now become a verb, which I never heard as a child, but uh, you could say now, I gifted him a book. Um, so you can find that uh, languages are undergoing these changes, and that resultative state is also, uh, you also have this verb uh, creation in a lot of other languages. So uh, for example, if we look at Persian and Japanese and Korean, in Persian you get this uh, noun plus kartan, and in uh, Japanese you get the noun plus suru, and in Korean you get the noun plus hada. So you have this uh, verb creation in a lot of these languages. So let's take a look at, a, at another example here. I put my notes of the ideas on the shelf. So putting is a causative verb. I'm changing the location of this, of this theme, this object. And so I can now take that shelf and turn it into a verb. I can say I shelved the ideas. It means I put them away for indefinite time. Um, so as I just mentioned, the noun in these sentences is the theme and it's absolute. The theme is what we call, in, is, a, is, a, is a title we give it in role and reference grammar. Um, the theme doesn't change. It's its corresponding state that changes. So it's its adjective that changes. Okay, so the ideas are still ideas. The door is still a door. And uh, you know, the dinner is still a dinner. So the theme can, it doesn't really necessarily have to be a subject or object. I mean, it really just depends on how you want to say the sentence. For example, uh, if I, I can use an existential verb in Russian, uh, which means happened. I can say an accident happened. And I would say, a avaria. A prizashlo has happened, and the accident comes after the verb, avaria. But I didn't say avariu, I didn't change it into another case. It's still a nominative case. So how can I have a nominative after the verb in Russian? Prizashlo avaria. Happened the accident. Well, that's just, you know, how it is. It's an absolutive. It didn't really do anything. It didn't, uh, you know, receive any action. So, uh, avaria doesn't change to the accusative case. It's still a nominative. So no matter, no matter where you put the theme in the sentence, it really shouldn't matter. It's not really a subject. It's not really an object at all. So, uh, many European uh, verbs that only take one theme argument are in fact put into the reflexive. Uh, those verbs become reflexives, and so that should help you with your European languages and knowing when to use a reflexive verb. So now, <laughs> the, the point of this video is to get to the ergative. So who's the ergative guy? This is the most important question you have to ask. Who is the ergative guy in the sentence? So what is of prime interest is the person who caused the thing to change. Who caused that event to happen? And whoever changed that state is the ergative guy. So when the policeman asks about, you know, who committed the crime, they're asking who is the ergative guy? Who's the ergative, who caused this to happen? Uh, so let's take a, a, an example of agents across um, different verbs. So there's something called a stative agent. For example, I speak English or I told a story. In both of these examples, I, I'm actually, uh, under, I'm actually doing that action volitionally. I'm, I'm doing it. So I am the uh, stative verb agent. So speaking and telling is not a special kind of verb. It's not a causative verb. It's just a stative verb. I speak English or I told a story. Another example is the, um, the okay, so the English and the story are themes of that stative verb. Okay, so I'm I'm conveying or telling that story. I'm just sending that story over to you. I didn't actually do anything to the story. I didn't do anything to the English. I'm just speaking in English. I'm using English to speak, okay? So in the next example, I'm going to use um, I as an action verb agent. So for example, I drive to London, or I'm sorry, I drive to work, I drove to work or I flew to London. In both of these examples, I'm doing a motion verb. I'm I'm the agent who is doing the motion and I'm going to a place. So these verbs usually connect with a location. Uh, uh, they usually have a, a location argument at, in that verb structure. So if I say I drove a car to London, the car is actually an instrument. I'm using the car in order to drive to London. So uh, 
In some cases, the car doesn't have to be mentioned. It's actually embedded in the verb itself. So when I say I flew to London, I didn't use my own wings to flap. I, in fact, I flew on an airplane to London, or I flew by airplane to London. I don't really have to mention it. I flew to London. Uh, we understand that there was an instrument involved there. So in these sentences, um, you know, none of these sentences are as actually using an ergative case. There's no person who is causing a change of state on something else. And so, uh, if I'm going to have a, a causative agent, I would have to have a different kind of sentence. So, for example, I closed the door. I changed the state of the door from open to closed. I am the ergative guy. I did it. I'm the one who caused that thing to change. I parked the car. I'm the agent of the causative sentence. I put the car in a new position. So the car has now changed its, its state in, in a parking spot. So I caused that thing to happen. Now, how does ergative case appear across languages? The ergative guy in Basque takes a K ending. The ergative guy in Georgian takes a Ma ending. The ergative guy in Korean takes an E or a Ga ending. The ergative guy in Japanese takes a Wa ending. And so if we take a look at a couple more examples, and we can see the difference between a non-ergative sentence and an ergative sentence in these languages. So let's take a look at the, the sentence, the man died. In this case, the man's adjective changed from alive to dead. In ergative languages, this man is in the absolutive case. So theoretically, I can also say, if word order doesn't matter, died a man. A man died, died a man. A man died died, there was, died, or that, or death happened, you know, for this man. Uh, so in Korean, what I would do is I would use the nun ending. To die is chukho soyo. Chukho soyo is, is, is already in the past tense. So I can say namja, the guy, namja nun, chukho soyo. Chukho soyo. So chukho soyo. Now pay attention to the chukho soyo because that's going to change in just a minute. So in Japanese, normally we would use the ga marker for these things that did not do that did not do anything. But however, Japanese has a special rule here because it's a person. We're going to still use wa. Okay, so it still is like um, because they still consider live uh, animate things to be agents. Okay, so we're going to say otoko. Otoko is the man. So otoko wa shinda. Otoko wa shinda. Okay, so uh, if it's a thing, you could say kore ga shinda, but things don't die, so you could just say, you know, you would have to be a different verb. Okay, so remember, uh, jumping from language to language, it may have its specific uh, details about how that language actually works or uses these things in, in more detail. Like in Georgia, you're going to have to learn a few little details. So think about it. Who is the ergative guy in the following sentence? The policeman killed the man. You want to know who did it, right? Who's the ergative guy? The man died. Who caused his death? The policeman caused his death. The policeman killed the man. Okay, so uh, in this case, it's very easy to tell, you know, the role of ergative ergativity in the sentence. So uh, when we when we take a look at how this sentence is translated across languages, first I'm going to take a look at Basque. Uh, theoretically speaking, I think that the policeman should have a K ending in Basque. Now, I don't know Basque. I don't know how to pronounce Basque either. So I'm going to do what I can uh, for this video. Um, I, put back, I put the sentence into Google Translate. Now, the thing is with Google Translate is you have to kind of learn how to feed Google Translate the right kind of sentence structures in order to get the right kind of grammar you want out of it. So you don't want to use things that's going to confuse Google Translate. If you have uh, sentence structures that where you have each of the rules uh, describe very clearly in your sentence, I believe that Google Translate is going to give you a really great answer. You have to learn how to use machine translation properly in order for it to give you the answers you want it to give you. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to do kind of a, a messy guess. That's why conversational stuff doesn't work so well with Google, Google Translate, although it's getting better. I would say you've got to learn how to uh, feed it the right kind of data. So when I put that into uh, Google Translate, I found that it was putting the word order a little bit differently than I wanted. So. Um, I got it out and it says uh, Polisiak Gizona, which is the man. So Polisiak Gizona Hilzuen. Now I don't know how to pronounce this Hilzuen, the, the verb section of that, that sentence. Uh, I might I maybe uh, pronouncing it wrong, but Polisiak does have the K ending. That looks cool. That's what I wanted, right? So in Georgian, the policeman would should have a Ma ending. And in Georgian, it's 
Policial ma, policial ma tachra kachi. So policial ma tachra kachi. So you get that ma ending in the Georgian as well. In Japanese, we would use the verb sasatsu. Sasatsu, sasatsu actually comes from the Chinese word um, uh, she sa. So it actually means to shoot and kill. So when we say this sentence in in Japanese, we're going to have the agent with a wa, keikan wa, and then the man, danse o. So they actually have an object marker for that person o. So keikan wa danse o and shasatsu shite shimaimashita. Shasatsu shite shimaimashita is the verb part. So in Korean, we need to change the verb to a causative verb. So remember, chugo soyo, to die, I'm gonna insert a little i into the verb, so it becomes chugyo soyo. Now, if you pronounce it smoothly, chugyo soyo, chugyo soyo, it's a little y sound, chugyo soyo. All right, so the sentence now becomes, the policeman is kyung chal guan, that comes from Chinese, jing cha guan. Kyung chal guan, kyung chal guan ni, Nam so again he receives the object marker, the, the, nan, the nam jia, nam jia, or it, it comes from Chinese word nan zi. so uh, nam jia ru, and then chu gyo so yo, so gyong chou guan ni nam jia ru, chu gyo so yo, and so that would, uh, that's already conjugated for the past tense. So Korean has another way to change the verb, so if you're using one of those hada verbs connected with the Chinese word that it borrowed from Chinese, you would switch the verb to a dui, to a dui uh, beginning on that. So it's pronounced very slightly dui, 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 like this. So now let's take a look at what is precisely the difference between these two kinds of verbs in Japanese and Korean, because this also confuses a lot of students. In Japanese, you have verbs like hajimaru. Hajimaru means to begin, and hajimeru. Hajimeru means to begin something. Okay, so notice the difference. You have a hajimaru and you have a hajimeru. So in Korean, that would be shizak dueda and shizak hada. So, shizakhada, you're actually going to do something, you're going to start something. And shizakhada is, it's doing it by itself, it's starting it, the action by itself. Yeah, so in Korean and Japanese, um, these kinds of verbs exist all over the language. And so if you have a sentence like class started that doesn't have an agent, let's take a look at how we're going to do it in Japanese and Korean. So when we take a look at the sentence, the class started, in Japanese that's jugyo ga hajimarimashita. Jugyo ga hajimarimashita, with an a in the verb. Okay, in Korean that's suobun shizakdueo soyo. Suobun shizakdueo soyo, with a due verb. And then if we say that the teacher started the class, then we're going to say sensei wa chugyo o, with the proper object there, hajime mashite. The teacher did it. So that me, hajime, is related to the teacher. Sensei wa hajime. And then the, the object is in the middle. Chugyo o hajime mashita. And in Korean, that's sensei nim i suo u shijak hesoyo. Again, sensei nim i suo u shijak hesoyo. And so that shijak goes directly with the hada verb here, not with the dui verb. So to cap up, uh, how these uh, work across languages. Obviously, Japanese and Korean are not really ergative languages, but understanding ergativity can also help us understand which subject marker to be using in Japanese and Korean. So, if there is no causative agent, then in Korean you're going to be using the un or nun, and in Japanese you're going to be using the ga. And if there is an agent in the Korean and Japanese, then you're going to be using the the wa in Japanese and the e in Korean. Now, in languages like Georgian, you're not going to be using ergative on anything except for the causative verb ergative. Now, the thing is with Basque is that you're going to be using the k ending on more than just the causative agent. You're going to be using it also on action verbs. Okay, so if I if I fly somewhere, or I go somewhere, that's also going to have the ergative case because that is the agent of the action in Basque. So uh, Georgian is a narrow case where Basque is a, is a wider case or get uh, application across the examples of sentences. Okay, so hopefully that helps you understand um, reflexive verbs in European languages. This concept of subject and object, throw it out the window until you get a grasp of how agents and themes work in sentences. The, the concept of causative verbs and how that tells us if something is um, absolutive or ergative. And so it, it should really help you give, give you a new framework for describing the world and the events around you. Remember subject and object kind of distort reality. 
Um, but using Roland Reference Grammar is a really great way to understand real-world events and describe them properly in the language that you're learning to learn, learning to speak. So thank you for watching, and if you have any questions to follow up about ergativity, please ask me and I'll try to help you answer your questions in upcoming videos.